So I'm going to speak really, really very briefly um, uh, about um, uh, the Coastal Federation. I want to remind um, everyone what happened in 2011 about around the uh, sea level rise, quote unquote, debate that happened in uh, the General Assembly. And then I want to tell you a little bit about, um, very briefly, about um, why Rob, um, Rob Young is a personal hero of mine. Um, so the Coastal Federation was founded 30 years ago. Um, in the living room of our executive director's um, uh, father's house, Todd Miller, uh, out on the coast, um, and uh, to address a, a variety of uh, development and policy um, uh, pressures that were going on on the coast. 30 years later, the Coastal Federation represents, um, has 10,000 members. Uh, it has offices um, in three, uh, in the three regions of the state, um, state's coastal area, north, middle, and south. Um, it employs about 17 people to do three, three basic areas of work. One is uh, policy advocacy. That's part of what I do on behalf of the Coastal Federation. But they're also involved in uh, development and policy um, issues um, out on the coast. Um, the Coastal Federation is one of the major partners in the fight against Titan Cement in New Hanover County. Um, and it's also partnering with um, developers and conservationists and lots of other folks to uh, rework the way in which uh, development is being done on the coast through um, something called uh, low impact development. Um, and we actually just received, the Coastal Federation just received a, um, uh, an award, uh, if you can imagine, from the uh, New Hanover County Development Community for um, the leadership that it's providing around um, LID work. In addition, the Coastal Federation is one of the largest uh, restorers of wetland and natural heritage um, in, um, on the East Coast. We're doing um, uh, wetland restoration um, at, in um, Carter County and also in Hyde County. These are um, projects that are uh, thousands of acres, two, more than 2,000 acres each, and um, uh, just restoring the coastal, um, coastal, land, uh, co coastal landscape and doing it with really unusual partners, farmers, developers, other folks, um, to restore those natural wetlands and also to, frankly, adapt or mitigate the you know, impact of um, uh, sea level rise, which we'll be talking about today. And then finally, we do a lot of education. We have educators in all three of our offices who, who work with um, thousands of kids every year to do on hand, on, or hands on marine sciences, um, wetland restoration, um, to really uh, help kids and the kids who live particularly out on the coast um, understand, and their parents and other community groups, adults too, uh, to understand how the coast works and why it's important. So that's the Coastal Federation in a Reader's Digest region. Um, now I'm going to give you a really quick reminder of the debate we had around sea level rise. Uh, Bill, and I see that Representative Pricey Harrison has just show, um, showed up, so she can uh, also, and there were a number of people in this room that were uh, very involved in that debate. Um, I see representatives here from the Southern Environmental Law Center, um, the Sierra Club. Uh, there were a number of um, organizations that were involved in the conversation, um, uh, if you can call it that, around sea level rise in 2011. You will recall that the Senate um, approved a bill. The sponsor was David Rouser, who's now running against Mike McIntyre for Congress. That bill did a couple things. Um, it uh, prohibited local governments from, um, uh, from it removed local government's authority for um, creating policy that were to adapt to sea level rise. Um, and more importantly, it included what we came to know and love as the Colbert language. It ended up on the Colbert Report. Uh, on a nine minute, um, in a nine minute spiel. If you haven't seen it, when you get home tonight, Google Colbert, um, sea level rise, and North Carolina, and you will, the clip is still there. And it's absolute comic genius. Um, and essentially what Stephen and others were, and this bill sort of made literally worldwide, uh, got worldwide attention. It prohibited state agencies from using prospective data to estimate or to develop policy around sea level rise. So that meant that if you're a state agency, you could only look at historic data. And of course, all of the data, the best data that we have around sea level rise is based on modeling. Um, and so it basically meant that a, a whole part of 
the science of sea level rise was off limits to policymakers um, in trying to develop policy around sea level rise. And that part of the bill was um, ridiculed quite, um, uh, um, quite vor voraciously, and it was the, basically the shorthand was that the General Assembly was trying to ban sea level rise or legislate sea level rise away. The bill went over that way. The, before it went, the, the Senate, the, the, the version of the bill that was passed um, included the coal bear language. They took out the prohibitions on local government. So they gave the, that authority back to the local government. But then the bill passed overwhelmingly in the Senate, sent it over to the House. And then the Senate caucus took that, uh, had a really hard time swallowing that legislation. Um, there were a number of um, uh, moderate Republicans um, who <coughs> objected to it, mostly on political, political grounds, because it was getting so much uh, press attention. And ultimately, what the House passed and the General Assembly, um, uh, the Senate went along with, and the um, Governor Perdue uh, allowed it to become law without signature, was a bill that prohibited state agencies from doing anything about sea level rise. It had ordered up yet another study. It took out the Colbert language, so the Colbert language was not, um, uh, did not become law. Um, and it ordered up yet another study on sea level rise to be due in 2016. And it included some language about um, uh, using all aspects of sea level rise science, including a full discussion about the merits of mo and the accuracy of modeling. So it basically punted the issue of what to do about sea level rise um, uh, until 2016, and that's essentially where we've been to date. I think that's a, um, we haven't really had much of a debate, as you might imagine, in this General Assembly about sea level rise. I know I'm over, but I want to do this very quickly. Recently, the Natu Natural Resources Defense Council did a de um, some polling in North Carolina about environmental and conservation issues. And they asked voters, they asked um, uh, North Carolinians of all um, stripes and all over the, um, the state, who was the, who's the best, most credible source of information around the conservation, the environment, sea level rise? And the, but the, the, the top of that list were scientists. Um, they, and, and the second was uh, business owners who are uh, impacted by um, uh, the, issue, the, the issues of the day. And so, you know, whenever these issues come up, um, those of us who work in the General Assembly around them look around and say, we really need a scientist. We really need somebody who has credibility on these on these topics to come and, you know, basically walk into a general assembly commission or committee meeting and get their heads taken off. Um, and you know that's no fun. And it's it's and there's uh, no real reward for it. Um, and it, but it's incredibly important work. Um, and there are a handful of folks in in the scientific community that are willing consistently um, to help us, um, to help folks on the, on the side of the issue. And um, Rob Young is one of those. Um, and whenever he has consistently, over and over and over again, been willing to stand up as a scientist and say, this is what the science says, and not just, not just do that, but sort of take on the deniers and take on the, um, the folks that would sort of want to, frankly, bury their heads in the sand on this issue. So, I just can't, Rob, I just want to tell you, Rob, on behalf of the Coastal Federation, for those of us who are doing this work in the General Assembly, and for those of us who are concerned about the policy questions concerning climate change and sea level rise, um, we're very, we're deeply indebted to your leadership um, and your willingness to sort of take time out of your scientific work and engage in the public policy <coughs> conversation because, frankly, we know it's a thankless job. Um, it's very, very important, and um, we really appreciate it. So, with that, I'll introduce you to Dr. Rob. Um, yeah. Thank you. I hope you guys offer me a job when uh, they take away tenure. <laughs> um, You know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a strange guy to have to be the, the flag carrier for an issue that's become so incredibly politicized. Um, I'm not a big fan of political labels. I'll just tell you a little bit about me. I grew up in a military family. My father's career army, real career army. Um, he's buried in Arlington. Um, 
You know, my wife's family, they all live in eastern North Carolina. They grow tobacco, cotton, where we'll be for Thanksgiving. I grew up on the coast. Uh, my mother still lives in the house I grew up in. My, one of my earliest childhood memories was having my neighborhood flooded by Hurricane Agnes, 1969. Um, tree went down on her barn during Isabel. I, you know, I get it. I get why people like to be and live at the coast. Um, I spend my time with family members of broadly diverse political opinions, uh, and none of whom I think I could ever sort of pigeonhole. And and I, you know, I like that. I like that we have that diversity in our family, and yet we can still get along and talk to each other and be respectful to each other and have Thanksgiving dinner together. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about the politics of talking about sea level rise and climate change in today's world. Some of my experiences with that. How we try to talk about climate change and sea level rise in, in ways that we hope regular folks will get and understand. Uh, tell you a little bit about the center that I direct and why we're involved in these kinds of issues, what we hope to accomplish. Uh, ultimately, we try to translate science into management in a way that makes sense, good science-based management. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what's been going on since Hurricane Sandy, primarily in New Jersey and New York and how I feel like we're missing a big opportunity to change the way we do business and a way to be more fiscally responsible than we typically are at the coast, to allow markets to provide better solutions that would both save taxpayers money and be environmentally beneficial. <clears throat> So the program for the study of developed shorelines has been around for more than 25 years now. It was started at Duke University by a gentleman uh, named Oren Pilkey, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, four, seven, eight years ago, Oren was looking for someone to uh, take over the, the directorship of the program. I was, had been ensconced in the mountains of North Carolina for a good eight years. And uh, quite frankly, uh, we didn't want to leave. Both of my children were born in our house, literally, so we will probably never, ever be able to leave the house that we live in. <laughs> and managed to negotiate a cooperative agreement with Duke that moved the center to Western Carolina University. But the program for the study of Elk Shorelines is effectively a cooperative effort between Duke and the UNC system at Western Carolina University. We do both scientific research, hard science, uh, National Science Foundation grants, uh, funded research, and policy work and outreach work as a part of our mission. Trying to communicate science to the general public in ways that uh, make sense. We work with the Park Service, with NOAA. We have restoration projects going on with the Eastern Band out in Western North Carolina. Uh, uh, an environmental ed center out in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington. Uh, we work with private industry, Patagonia, for example, Nature Conservancy and Surfrider Foundation, all major partners with the work that we do. We do externally funded applied research. We produce some data products that I'm gonna go through for you very quickly. We try and communicate science and uh, serve when asked lo both local, state, and federal agencies. We provide a tremendous amount of pro bono advice to local homeowners groups, local homeowners who call us up and say, hey, somebody wants to build a groin on my beach. Is this a good idea? Will you review the engineering plans? We're somewhat, uh, we're somewhat unusual for an academic group in, in that several of us are actually licensed professional geologists, uh, which for academics is kind of unusual. So you know, we don't mind doing very practical work and, sort of getting our hands dirty. Uh, right now, uh, one of the projects we're most excited about is we've been working with the National Park Service for two years 
to identify all of the park assets at risk to uh, approximately a meter of sea level rise and, and uh, basically creating a list for all the nation's national parks for what might be at risk over the next 100 years and what's not and helping the park devise adaptation strategies for all of those assets. Uh, just on Monday, I was up at the National Park Service in DC and uh, this has been some very rewarding work for us. It's quite an honor to be able to, to play a role in helping to preserve the nation's cultural heritage. And uh, we're literally going through, uh, right now we have a list of 41 parks and identifying every single asset in those parks. Trail, road, building, archeological site that is at risk to storms and long-term sea level rise and then helping the parks develop strategies for what to do about that, like the poster child for relocation on the coast right here in North Carolina, moving the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Uh, there are, uh, believe it or not, communities that are interested in rising sea level, so we work at the community level with uh, places like Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, uh, Miami-Dade County, folks up in New York with uh, some sea level, long term sea level rise planning strategies. We have a one and a half million dollar National Science Foundation grant to work on uh, the nation's largest dam removal project on the Elwha River in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington. This has also been a really wonderful project. Uh, our part of those two reservoirs that have been dammed for a hundred years, the dams are coming out to return salmon to the river. Um, and our part of this is what happens when all the sediment that was in these reservoirs gets to the coast. So when the, it's a really interesting experiment. Um, it'll be the nation's largest environmental restoration project, but it may also be one of the nation's largest economic restoration projects. This is a river that used to have almost half a million salmon swim up in it every year before the dams went in 100 years ago. This is wild Pacific salmon, seven different runs, coho, king, chinook. Have you looked at the price of wild Pacific salmon in the supermarket lately? Just imagine if you return 300,000 fish to that river every year, the economic benefits to this community, because those fish are going back up that river to die. There's the dams that are pulled. We've also developed a geologic monitoring manual for the Park Service. These lights be dams are there. Help? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, wait a minute. Try. Yeah. This is the, the middle way. The one that's lighting the screen. I know, I know. I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> ah, sorry. Okay, that's a little bit better. Um, we have been building with this uh, funding from NOAA uh, a national storm surge database. So we have built an online database of every single storm surge measurement ever made in the United States of America. It's geo-referenced. Um, you can click on the data point and you can see, get information about it. You can figure out what hurricane it was, what the measurement was. It's linked directly to the source. Uh, I think we have, I don't know, 10,000 points in there right now. What's really fun about it is you can go to our website, to the Storm Surge viewer. Maybe you're thinking about buying a house. You can type in the address and plot all the storm surge measurements within 10 miles around that particular house. Or you can look at all the storm surge measurements from a particular hurricane or something like that. We're also uh, working on a, a droid app uh, for, for the storm that will access the storm surge database. So you can imagine Jim Cantore, this is what we imagine at least when we're dreaming. Jim Cantore holding on to the light post as the storm's coming ashore, and he looks, he pulls up his smartphone and he says, uh, the highest storm surge measurement ever recorded in, in, from this spot where I'm standing, according to the WCU storm surge database, is 20 feet from Hurricane Irene. Uh, uh, the realtors will not like this, <laughs> though no offense to any realtors in the room, um, but the, the, our job is to provide information to people, you know, what you do with it and the implications of that, that's, but you know, this is, um, if, if you're in the market for coastal property, you might want to know and you might want to check what the average storm surge heights have been near the place that you're considering investing. 
Uh, we also host the nation's only beach nourishment database. Beach nourishment's been getting a lot of attention lately. I'm going to be talking about it today. You can track uh, every beach nourishment project in the U.S. and well, the part that most people are interested in, you can track the spending. And there's a staggering amount of public funds spent on building beaches in the United States of America every year. And I'll talk about what's going on after Hurricane Sandy towards the end of my presentation. There it is. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> we also have something that you might be interested in. We have an online image database. We frequently do reconnaissance after storms. We do work on the ground. We make the images available immediately. Uh, we distribute them pro bono. People who want to use them, we just ask that you give us credit and let us know that you're doing it. Uh, another very uh, uh, unusual product that we have, we have something called a gray literature library, where we have engineering project design documents going back 50 years, cataloged by state for old beach nourishment projects, groins, jetties, all kinds of things like this, that uh, if these documents exist somewhere else, it's probably, you know, on a dusty shelf in some engineer's office in the Army Corps. Uh, we're in the process of creating PDFs out of all of these and putting it online so that you'll be able to come to us, search our database, and we can send you the document. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about sea level rise and uh, climate change. Um, as, as, as Rob mentioned, um, there have been a number of surveys, including one done by a joint Yale-George Mason group looking at communicating climate change. A number of surveys trying to figure out you know, why there are still so many folks that are skeptical, why there's this growing distrust in some sectors of the scientific community, and who people really do trust to tell them about science, and science related to climate change and sea level rise. And it is true that even in these national surveys, the majority of Americans do still say that they trust scientists most to talk to them about climate change and sea level rise, which, that's nice. The problem is that Americans don't know any scientists. So when you ask them to name a scientist that they know and trust, they name a lot of dead people. And they name people who aren't exactly climate scientists. This is problematic. It's interesting, that, you know, in, in Canada, McLean's magazine. Any, any Canadians here today? No? No? I'm going to say nice things about Canada. <laughs> McLean's magazine does a survey every year, most trusted Canadians, you know? And you would think it might be some hockey player or something, right? Or, um, but it's a man named David Suzuki. Three years in a row, a guy named David Suzuki. David Suzuki is a scientist. He does nature programs on CBC television. Um, very popular guy. And David Suzuki, not only is he a scientist, but he is the most trusted Canadian. And he uh, communicates with Canadians regularly about climate change, especially in their Arctic and polar regions where they're very concerned. We don't have that kind of connection here in the US. And it's, I think it's part of our problem. And part of the problem is that scientists in the states aren't that great uh, at talking with regular people. And you know, we don't, we're uncomfortable doing it and we're not doing a very good job at the moment. And as, you know, as a result of that, a lot of the discussion regarding climate change and sea level rise is being led by people who aren't scientists or maybe the sort of borderline scientists and sort of draws in a lot of hyperbole and it gets politicized a little bit too fast. Um, you know, Al Gore, probably a really nice guy, <coughs> did us no favors. <coughs> And that's just a personal opinion of somebody who's in the trenches on this every day. I, you know, I believe Al Gore was sincere in his concerns and that it wasn't purely a political issue for him, but he did us no favors. 
So this is again from the Yale George Mason group, and the, the, the global warming is America's, you know? And uh, so you have a group on one end um, that, according to this research from Yale and George Mason, is probably not real interested in hearing about climate change or the, the science of climate change, no matter what. Not interested in hearing the science or the facts about it. Uh, conflicts with their worldview, they don't want to hear. But I think what too many advocates for climate change forget is that the folks on this side, the folks who absolutely believe in climate change, they may not know any more about climate change than this person. They may not know any more about the science. In fact, they probably don't that these folks were just as predisposed to jump on board with the idea that humans are destroying the Earth as these folks are to jump on board with the idea that they're not right. And, you know, I think it's important to remember this, to keep this all in perspective. <laughs> that we all bring our own individual biases and needs and concerns to the table when we're talking about any issue. You know, we often spend a lot of time making fun of the skeptics, things like this, you know. Um, but we have to keep in mind that, you know, everybody comes to the table with their own set of biases when you're talking about just about any issue. What's, what's, been, what's been hardest about this for many of my colleagues is the degree of vitriol that uh, has been a part of this particular debate and how quickly it gets personal. Um, you know, a nice uh, speech by Christopher Monckton talking to the International Conference on Climate Change sponsored by the Heartland Institute, referring to the IPCC, where are they all today? Those bedwetting, moaning minis of the apocalyptic traffic light tendency, those greens too yellow to admit they're really red. Wow. <laughs> I mean, so if you believe in climate change, you're a, uh, an environmentalist and a communist, I guess, is the implication here right off the bat. Um, and all of you, of course, heard that several years ago, the science panel of the Coastal Resources Commission was asked to write a sea level rise planning document. We were instructed by the Coastal Resources Commission to provide a planning number for sea level rise for the state of North Carolina. We were instructed only to use peer-reviewed scientific literature in this report and give it to the Coastal Resources Commission. The science panel, which has been together for 20 years, never been criticized for anything, recommending setbacks and how you determine the quality of sand that goes on beaches, inlet hazard areas. The science panel went about the business of doing what we have always done, looking at the peer-reviewed literature and writing a report. The report the science panel wrote made no policy recommendations, said nothing about what you should do with this information. That was not what we were asked to do. We were told to produce a number to be used for planning. We weren't even told to predict a precise rate of sea level rise. We were told to recommend a number that should be used for planning. And then this is how the science panel was characterized for doing as asked by the Coastal Research Commission. I'm not saying these people are liars. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Thompson was misquoted um, in the media. This was uh, picked up broadly by a number of different papers. I'm saying that they have passion for sea level rise and they can't give it up. I don't want to say that they're being dishonest. <laughs> But they're pulling data out of their hip pocket that ain't working. A handful of CRC selected scientists who are bent on promoting their personal political agenda. These people are either totally incompetent or they're just dishonest. I'm not sure which of those two I prefer. <laughs> Let me assure you that the science panel for the Coastal Resources Commission is made up of people of varying political ideologies. Several members work for the Army Corps of Engineers, okay? Um, 
And I don't even know what anyone's political ideology is on the science panel. The report that we wrote was a consensus report that used peer-reviewed literature. The report that we wrote was externally reviewed. The report that we wrote conforms precisely with expert reports written in 12 other states and policy statements released by the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, the National Academies, and the European Ge Geosciences Union. For us to have written a report any different than the one we wrote would have been scientific malpractice. End of the story. Peer-reviewed literature. That's what we were asked to put in the report. That's what we did. It's backed up by all of these other scientific organizations. Prediction is dishonest statistically, no better than a coin flip, bent on promoting their personal political agenda. Um, well, we've lost some members of the science panel because of this. <laughs> you might not be surprised to learn. People who were stunned to find out that simply by writing a scientific report that their personal integrity would be questioned. And that they would be trotted out in the newspaper as having a liberal policy agenda. When really they just thought they were doing their jobs. And when they were not, these, these, these folks were not interested in making any policy recommendations from how that number is used. <clears throat> Even some well-respected national engineers, basically uh, Robert Dean said, there's an overemphasis on unrealistically high sea level rise. The reason is budgets. I'm retired, so I have the freedom to report what I find without any bias or need to chase funding. <clears throat> wow, what a statement for someone to make who is arguably the, the, nation's, the nation's leading coastal engineer to suggest that we're doing all of this purely to get uh, grant money, right? This is what a lot of people believe is going on. Uh, uh, oh, I believe mankind causes global warming. Okay, give him his research funds. Um, well, see, this just doesn't really make sense, by the way. Because if I get a million and a half dollar National Science Foundation grant, I don't get a million and a half dollars. <laughs> NSF buys out portions of my salary, but that goes to my university. My university does well if I get a million and a half dollar National Science Foundation grant. The other thing is that so here's the, the real thing. You know, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, American Geophysical Union, all of these organizations have endorsed the idea that the planet's getting warmer, that sea level is rising, and that the scientific community <coughs> expects an acceleration in the rate of sea level rise. Oh, but they're just doing it for the grant money, right? You know what percentage of the members of those scientific organizations are climate scientists? It's less than 2%, okay? Less than 2%. So either the climate scientists are so smart that they have fooled the other 98% of the scientists into making sure that they, the climate scientists get all the grant money. There's only a certain amount of grant money available from the National Science Foundation. <laughs> and those other scientists are fools for buying into the need to examine global climate change. Or, all those other scientists have looked at the body of evidence and said, yes, the science is good. This is something we need to be concerned about. <laughs> we would never collude on anything. Why do you ask? I love the political cartoons r related to climate. I collect and c climate change cartoons. <laughs> Um, the thing about science is, if you're a young doctoral student, you will never make a, a name for yourself just by getting in line and repeating everything that the people who came before you said. 
The most famous scientist in America will be the one who proves conclusively that there is absolutely no link between global warming and sea level rise, or that there is no link between greenhouse gases and a warming planet. Scientists make a name for themselves by overthrowing dogma. Okay, so now I said that. Now let me just say that I don't think we're doing a good job of explaining to people why they should care. <laughs> and I don't think we do a good job of communicating. I can't tell you how many <coughs> times I've been asked to come talk about sea level rise and then the person before me goes and what they talk about is the end of the earth before me. And it might be someone who does one of the really popular climate blogs, I won't call them, any of them out by name. <laughs> but, you know, the start with seven meters of sea level rise and the earth is flooded, you know, up to Raleigh and, you know, that's no place to start a conversation about making sensible changes to deal with the changing planet. You know, if you go down to Miami Beach and you try and talk to the city council, the chamber of commerce, why they should be concerned about sea level rise, and the first thing you show them is Miami underwater, <laughs> what's the point, you know? Uh, close up shop and leave now. Um, it, just telling people bad news is, uh, is not the way to get most people interested in having a real discussion with you about a topic. You, and you can't expect that everybody in America is going to have an environmental ethic. I, I love this one, right? The polar, the polar bear saying the bad news is the ice cap is melting and it's going to be almost impossible to catch seals. The good news is we keep moving south, there's tons of fat animals called humans who can't run very fast. <laughs> um, you know, um, I've got family, believe it or not, who do not care about the polar bears. Uh, they don't even care about the microscopic life that is the bottom of the food chain that feeds the krill in Antarctica. There are a lot of people in the country that are worried about having a job or health insurance or something else, you know? So, you know, we also, you, you can't expect everybody to care about this from, from an environmental perspective. <laughs> and there is a lot of skepticism about, you know, what is today's doomsday scenario. I'm just saying, this is the reality within which we deal. Of course, here's what the scientists believe the picture is politically. <laughs> <clears throat> or, yeah, I should probably scratch Carl Rove out of that and just make it some sort of ambiguous uh, person. Then it would be a little less politicized. Um, somewhere in here, you know, eventually I think we all have to find a way to talk to each other about these issues. And scientists in particular need to do a better job of communicating to regular Americans why it will eventually be in their self-interest to care about these things. And I'll give you what I think are a couple of those reasons um, in, in just a second. But, but first, um, I'll give you my sort of 10-minute version of how I approach talking about climate change to the Kiwanis or the Ruritan which I try to do fairly frequently, because I think it's, it's our job to talk to people who are skeptical about what we're talking about. And it's really easy just to go give a talk to the Asheville Sierra group. <clears throat> First of all, uh, um, when I give these talks, I, I typically don't like to, uh, this may be a cop out, but I don't like to talk about who's cl causing climate change. First step, are important in any discussion. So I like to talk about first steps a lot. So first, we all need to agree that the planet is warming. And the planet is unquestionably warming. 
I don't care who's causing it for the moment. Planet's getting warmer. And the way to, to be sure that the planet is getting warmer is to look at all those aspects of the Earth that respond to temperature that average out the fluctuations. And the, the, the strange thing that I'm going to say to you today, no offense to NASA's Jim Hansen, is that the worst way to talk to people about the fact that the planet's getting warmer is by using temperature data. Because if all you do is talk about some temperature plot, I mean, who can absorb this anyway? I mean, my gosh, the y-axis is only like in tenths of a degree centigrade. Does that sound terrible to you? Um, and if you just talk about, temp I don't even know how you take the Earth's temperature. I mean, I'm sure that there are people who know and thought about this a lot, but I don't really, this is such a complex system, I don't believe we really know what kind of temperatures matter the most. Nighttime temperature, daytime temperature, winter temperatures, summer temperatures, long-term averages. I mean, how do you take the temperature of the Earth, the atmosphere, the ocean? Um, if you talk about temperature only when you're talking about global warming, then you get wonderful political cartoons like this. See the stop global warming protester has to burn his sign because it's so cold outside. Remember a couple of years ago we had that really cold winter and people had to go shovel 24 inches of global warming off their sidewalk. And um, it's the difference between weather and climate is confusing to a lot of people. It's the long-term averages that matter. But if you just talk about temperature, you know, you get to, in 2009, we had this huge temperature anomaly where it was really cold in North America, even though it was boiling over here in Africa. And there was quite a bit of kerfuffle about that incredible winter. We had, we had a great winter in the mountains that year, by the way. 12 inches of snow at Christmas. My kids thought that it was just, you know, it was like TV Christmas. We had TV Christmas. <laughs> the way to understand if the planet's warming or not is to look at the natural systems on the planet that respond to temperature. Mountain glaciers, for example, are very sensitive long-term indicators of temperature. The Athabasca Glacier in Canada, the Uppsala Glacier in Argentina, almost every single mountain glacier on the planet, every continent, both hemispheres is retreating and has been retreating for a long time. <coughs> if you want to see the snows of Kilimanjaro, you've got 10 or 12 years left. Glacier National Park in Montana is losing its glaciers very rapidly. 20, 25 years maybe. Will they change the name? <laughs> I don't know. We will be without glacial ice in the lower 48 when that happens. Northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, retreating ice sheets. Surface melt on Greenland is expanding. You could, if you wanted to, try and argue the details on one of these points, you put them all together and you have clear evidence of a warming planet. Uh, in fairness, there there's a, oh, was an uptick in Antarctic ice uh, recently, but the trend of the graph has been clearly down for a long time. Uh, North Pole was ice free for the first time a few years ago. Where does Santa, where does Santa keep his workshop now? I don't know. Did the pole fall into the ocean? Uh, there's a lot of back and forth about what's going on in Antarctica, but again, if you look at the consensus documents from the leading scientific organizations, at least the West Antarctic ice sheet has shown accelerated thinning throughout the decade. Put all of these things together, and what you see is clear evidence Canada is very interested in permafrost. Uh, Canada has been losing permafrost at an incredibly rapid rate in the Arctic areas. This is not an esoteric question in Canada, permafrost. There are cities built on permafrost. The permafrost thaws, stuff sinks into the ground. Roads buckle, bad things happen. Yes, Alaska too. Canadians are monitoring this very carefully. The trend is for losing 
permafrost. Um, I know, it's, uh, my, my wife doesn't think I should show that one. Um, sorry. And then there's the topic of today's presentation, which is rising sea level. There's only two ways that you can increase the volume of water in the global ocean over the short time frame. There's a couple ways you can do it. If you've got tens of millions of years, you can change the rate of place move quickly. We're talking about over decades. You can warm the water and it expands, or you can add water to the ocean. You can add water by melting glaciers, melting mountain glaciers, melting great ice sheets. And right now we're doing both. Surface waters are warming, the ice sheets are melting, adding water to the global ocean. The, the volume of the global ocean is increasing, and that's raising sea level. We see this from tide gauge data. We're measuring it now directly via satellite. <coughs> The dreaded uh, IPCC took all of this, put it together, and produced a new series of predictions for what sea level might do in the future based on a direct linkage to uh, global warming driven by human activities. So we have a low and a high scenario for what might happen with rates of sea level rise going somewhere from in the 40 centimeter range up to a median of 78 and then a catastrophic estimate of over one meter or 1.2, something along those lines. In the state of North Carolina, we're fortunate to have excellent historical sea level rise data by the group at East Carolina University who, in conjunction with the United States Geological Survey, has been working on sea level rise projects for the last 20 years. Fabulous, fabulous, high-quality scientific work. Thousands of sediment cores from all over eastern North Carolina looking at sea level rise indicators in the cores and reconstructing a long-term geological perspective on how sea level has changed in eastern North Carolina by looking at microfossils and marsh sediments uh, a a multi-investigator, long-term project uh, where they have constructed sort of a couple thousand year sea level curve. If you look at it over a geological time period of the last couple of thousand years, there's clearly a higher rate of sea level rise now than there has been in the last couple thousand years, geologically speaking. The rate of sea level rise that you have, of course, also depends on what the land is doing. The global ocean right now is around 3.1, 3.2 millimeters per year sea level change. So 31, 32 centimeters per century of sea level change, 10 inches or so. But the, where you are matters. So in Louisiana, there are places where that rate of rise, because Louisiana is sinking, is eight to nine millimeters per year, three times the change in the global ocean rate. There are places up north where sea level is actually dropping because the land is coming up. The hotspot for sea level rise on the east coast is right around Tidewater, Virginia, for a couple of reasons. One related to very complex post-glacial land readjustment and the other related to the fact that they've sucked their groundwater out of the ground so fast that they've basically sucked themselves down into the ocean. That's my home, by the way. <laughs> so, but then I say this and then, you know, I really don't want to talk about the acceleration of the rate of sea level rise anymore. Um, I even wrote a book about sea level rise and I don't even really want to read it anymore. <laughs> And the reason, and this is the sort of the second half of my, the reason is because we are not even doing a very good job right now of managing the coast with the things that we know are changing at the rates that we know they're changing at. 
So I don't need to project seven meters of sea level rise into the future to tell you that we have problems right now at the coast that we're not dealing with in a sensible way. In fact, if you have a coastal plain that has slopes that are approaching one to 5,000 or one to 10,000 like we do, you know what? 10 inches of sea level rise, that's a lot. <laughs> that's enough. If you're in Miami-Dade County, 10 inches of sea level rise is a big, big problem. So let's put aside an acceleration in the rate of sea level rise for just a minute. Let's just talk about what we know is happening. Let's do what the legislature wanted us to do. We'll give them a symbolic victory. We'll spend the rest of the talk just talking about a straight line extrapolation of sea level rise on the coast and, and why that still matters. We don't do a good job of convincing people that sea level rise is even occurring and why it matters to them. You know? But I tell you what, you get out of your vehicle in eastern North Carolina and you see an awful lot of this. This used to be forest, now it's marsh. This is sea level rise. The vast majority of the wetlands in eastern North Carolina have rims of dead trees on the upland margins of those wetlands. That is direct evidence that sea level has been rising in eastern North Carolina and the hydrology is changing. I spent a lot of my time hanging out with old timers who farm east of the Suffolk Scarp on the lower, lower coastal plain. And those folks will tell you that they're planting much later in the season now than they used to. You know, some crops like tobacco don't like to be too wet. And the reason is because the water doesn't go down the pipe anymore. The hydrology's backed up way out there on the coastal plain. It has to evaporate. It doesn't drain. You can ditch it all you want to. The ditches are just bringing more water in. These are the kinds of stories we need to talk about when we're talking about sea level rise and climate change. Hal Monless from the University of Miami put together a real nice series of photos from Florida DOT monitoring of bridge abutments. It shows the intertidal organisms encroaching, moving up those bridge abutments with time. Pretty neat. Either there's been long-term sea level rise or the oysters are growing lungs. <laughs> <laughs> Tidewater Virginia, you don't have to tell those people that there's sea level rise. They're wading in it. Charleston, Miami, the nuisance flooding in these communities is real. You don't have to tell anybody in Norfolk, Virginia, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, I don't care. You don't have to tell them that sea level is rising and we need strategies to deal with it in a sensible way because even small storms do things like flood the Midtown Tunnel or leave the Chrysler Museum isolated as an island as it was the last time I tried to go and the wind was blowing the wrong way. I assure you, they did not build these things in those vulnerable locations. Go to Charleston, South Carolina and go to the Battery when there's a spring tide. Charleston, South Carolina is spending a huge amount of money to pump their storm water down, that's right, down, 200 feet underground, over to the coast, back up, and then out into the ocean. Because the nuisance flooding has gotten so bad. Charleston is not subsiding. <clears throat> so is sea level uh, rise accelerating? This is the you know, $80 million question. Right? right now, the answer is no, over the last two decades. If you look just at the satellite altimetry data, the global ocean, straight line, last couple decades. Boy, would it make our job easier if it was doing this, just doing that. The scientific community, from a tremendous number of lines of evidence, not just from computer models, believes that that will change. But right now, we got to be honest. Say it out loud. Right now, 
Over the last two decades, we have not seen an acceleration. Now, if you talk about the last 2,000 years, there's clearly been an acceleration. You know, prediction about the future is difficult. The science panel report admitted all of this, okay? Um, the science panel in the report they submitted to the Coastal Resources Commission said, we would like to revisit this topic every five years and write a new report because we think it's gonna change. We need to update it every five years. That's what our report said. That's the kind of dishonesty we put in our report. <laughs> every five years, we need to do this again. That's what we, our report said. Because it may change. We need to monitor rather than just computer model. We spend so much money right now doing computer modeling of these systems, we don't do as much data, real data collection as we should. By the way, I understand that we're probably running a little bit late for a variety of reasons. I will not be offended if anybody has to stand up and uh, leave. So, you know, I try and convince people that at least the planet is warming, I don't care who's causing it. And that sea level is clearly rising, I don't care who's causing it. It's probably gonna accelerate in the future, but yeah, we don't have to talk about that right now. Let's just talk about what we do right now, right? Actually, this is, this is the new arc. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, we're doing all the wrong things. <laughs> Even with the current rate of sea level rise, knowing what we know, we still do everything wrong. This is Benidorm, Spain, ever been there? This is a picture from the 70s. This is what it looks like now, <laughs> right? Okay, this is, this is a big part of the problem wow. here. Forget about climate change mitigation. I mean, if you're doing this, this is going this way, and this is going this way, well, that's a problem. And I think what these coastal communities need to understand is that there are all these, this whole suite of problems that we are clearly seeing at, happening from sea level rise right now that people just don't tie directly to sea level rise. We got land that won't perk in eastern North Carolina and all over the southeast. We've got storm water runoff systems failing in cities requiring expensive repairs, threats to coastal agriculture, a whole variety of different problems. Some great work from the University of Hawaii, Chip Fletcher, showing how sea level rise has backed up the water table in Honolulu and the flooding is occurring not from the ocean but it's coming up out of the ground in many places that are low elevation in Honolulu right now. In places where that never used to happen before. Why should you even care about this? Well, you know, if you're a resort community like Nagtad or something like that, what you have to understand is that even without a, an acceleration of the rate of sea level rise, when we have to start spending huge amounts of federal dollars to protect Manhattan and Miami and Charleston and Savannah and Boston, there's not going to be any money left for these other co coastal communities to make sensible adaptation plans, right? When, when this happens, oh, I hate to show pictures like that. When something like this happens, you know, there's not going to be, nobody's going to be paying attention to the rice crop and flooding in Bangladesh and the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, when we're trying to, you know, repair that economic infrastructure, places like Fort Sumter, what are we going to do with all these civil war forts, almost all of which are within a meter of sea level? So why start planning now for something that might only be a problem 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Because that's a wise thing to do. And because all of these places are gonna be dealing with this issue in the future and we can't spend all the money at once. We're still largely failing to deal with sea level rise. Ocean front development continues. We still spend billions in an attempt to hold the shoreline in place. Billions of public funds. Public funds. There's no national recognition of the problem, and there are almost no penalties for unwise planning or development. And now let me give you the sandy example. Or maybe we'll start with Dauphin Island. I forgot I had this in here. This is Dauphin Island, Alabama. Anybody own a house in Dauphin Island? Okay. This is the poster child for what we're doing wrong. 
Dolphin Island, Alabama has received a federal presidential disaster declaration seven times in the last 25 years. <coughs> seven times the feds have rode into Dolphin Alabama, Island, Alabama and put the infrastructure back, put the road back. We even, after Katrina, pumped the sand from the back side of the island back around to the front side of the island so we could replant the lots. Federal funds, right? We use federal monies for beach nourishment projects on Dolphin Island of them to rebuild the beach. Even the Mobile Press Register thinks that this is crazy. But here's the thing, people say to me all the time, well gosh, Rob, those people in Dolphin Island, Alabama, they must be crazy keep rebuilding those homes, right? They must be crazy. No, they're not crazy. Those are all investment homes, it's not primary homes. They're still making money. <laughs> we are crazy. <laughs> they are not crazy. They're making a rational economic decision. They are not having to factor in the risk of being there into the cost of that property or the rental of that home. We got their back. And unfortunately, from my perspective, this is what's happening post Sandy. We have had a, just a ton of projects going on in the last year post Sandy. From everything from the you know, state of New York, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation and Parks, the town of Southampton, citizens groups uh, of wealthy property owners in places like Quag and East Hampton, working with Surfrider Foundation, a variety of different projects. And here's my take home message from what's going on after Hurricane Sandy that we have made, post Sandy, a de facto policy decision on a federal level without any debate or discussion. And, the, and, and this is the decision we've made. We're going to hold all the shorelines in place for the foreseeable future, at least 50 years, according to the Corps of Engineers. At least 50 years. We're going to hold them all in place. And we're going to do it with public funds. We're going to do it with public funds. Whatever the cost, the Corps of Engineers is going to spend $4.1 billion in the North Atlantic Division alone post Sandy on coastal protection projects. Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut. $4.1 billion. Pretty soon, we're going to be talking about real money. <laughs> and what they're doing is pumping beaches back in front of investment property. Yes. There are some areas that have working class, middle class homes, the Rockaways, Long Beach. You can get up into Staten Island and places like that. They're not building beaches in Staten Island. In fact, some folks in Staten Island, some folks in Queens are actually taking a buyout from the governor of New York. Yeah, a couple hundred houses maybe. Because they're living in their primary home and they're worried. Here's the one exciting thing that happened. There was some good thing that happened. This is New Inlet on Fire Island National Seashore. Quite a bit of controversy when it, the inlet opened up right after Hurricane Sandy. Strangely enough, the new inlet on Fire Island opened up in a place called Old Inlet. <laughs> Another good investment tip for the coast. <laughs> Don't buy a home in any community with the words Old Inlet in the name somewhere. <laughs> the Corps wanted to close this inlet immediately because that is what they do, you know. Um, if your primary tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The state of New York and the National Park Service resisted and the inlet's been open for a year now. And it has been an incredible success story. The fact that this inlet has opened, it has added a huge amount of sand to the back of the island. This inlet will eventually close, but the island will be fatter here. It'll be less vulnerable. Not only that, for the first time in 15 years, there was no red tide this summer back here. The fishermen are gushing about the results of keeping that inlet open. That's an economic benefit to that community. There are many places at the coast 
We're doing the right thing for the environment and maintaining natural processes have real economic benefits and we don't do a good enough job of elucidating those connections to build coalitions that make sense. <clears throat> this is the Ocean Parkway. It's in a New York State park. We were brought in there right after Hurricane Sandy because uh, the New York DOT wanted to build a massive seawall here for about $38 million for this road that has nothing behind it in a park. We managed to talk them out of the seawall, um, so they built a dune instead, and a beach nourishment project. It was still about $28 million of federal funds to protect this one road. Nothing back here at all. <clears throat> I really love this dune because this is, the, the Corps calls these restoration projects. Um, so this is the sand dune restoration for Jones Beach Park. I don't know how many of you have ever been to the beach. I don't know if you've ever seen a natural sand dune that quite looks like a giant trapezoid that runs for... Um, you know, this is the problem when you start to do restoration projects for coastal protection. The sort of the restoration part becomes secondary and the protection part becomes primary. So you build natural systems that actually don't exist in nature, like the trapezoidal dune. Um, the Corps' message for New Jersey and New York is that beaches and the dunes that we build have to be continuous. Because where there are breaks, there are problems. I'm not kidding. Literally, the Corps' vision is that the federal government should be building dunes like this and beaches from New Jersey to the tip of Long Island. What I really like about this one too, is you, you see here, see this strange dark stuff? So the last time I was out there, they were smearing this on the back of the dune. And I'm like, why, why are you putting dirt on the sand dune? And it's because they put in sod on the oh, sand dune. Crap. <laughs> I don't know if they're gonna open up a mini golf course on that or, or what. Well, unfortunately, because they put the dune back in a place where dune didn't really want to be anymore, you know, because the storm tried to move the island, unfortunately, the dune got rapidly eroded during some nor'easters this year, which uh, really worried everybody. Oh, no, you, you know, I thought that dune was going to last 200 years. Um, and so um, uh, the senior senator from New York, who I won't call out by name, but his name rhymes with Duck Bloomer, um, <laughs> rushed down to the beach to say, the feds have invested millions in rebuilding the road. Now they need to create a plan to protect it in the years to come. The plan would require the court to prioritize funding for a dredging, blah, 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 50 years. Okay, so the Democratic senator from New York, who supposedly has an appreciation for climate change, runs down to a, the beach in a barrier island that's no wider than this room and is about three feet high, and the only thing on that barrier island is one road, and it's in a park, and says, we need federal money to protect this road for 50 years. Huh? <laughs> um, I think he was off message. <laughs> <clears throat> Surprisingly, the Corps thought this was a great idea. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly good approach to address the problems. <laughs> the president had a Sandy task force. They released their report in uh, August. There's really lots of really good stuff in there. It was real science-y, you know, how you can use science to improve the flood maps and use science to figure out how high to elevate the buildings and figure out better ways to get the money in there as fast as possible after a storm. And there's only one thing missing. There was not a single mention in there about taking a step back from the hazard. <laughs> nothing in there about managed retreat, nothing in there about what to do long term. You know, it was, it was the same message. Elevate structures, hold the shorelines in place. This is the message from Hurricane Sandy. Primary adaptation action, action is elevate, elevate. Not move, elevate. 
like is happening with this lovely house here in Southampton. The house is being elevated. Well, the problem with elevating structures is that, you know, it's like if you're in a river that's rising due to flood. A couple of choices if you don't want to get wet. You can roll up your pants and keep standing in the river. Eventually, you're probably going to get wet. Or step out of the river. We're rolling up our pants as a response to Hurricane Sandy. The Corps of Engineers, <laughs> elevated structures, is that the answer? And we're even going to try and elevate whole towns, maybe, like we did with Galveston, Texas. The ironically named town of Highlands, New Jersey, <laughs> <laughs> turns out needs to be a little higher. The Army Corps of Engineers is planning at the moment, this is probably a low estimate, to, to pump 26 million cubic yards of sand onto the beaches stretching from the Delaware line up to Montauk Point and Long Island. 26 million cubic yards of sand at tremendous expense. And it's a temporary fix, right? It's all going to go away. 100% federal cost share. 100% federal cost share. This, if we do this here, how can we not do this when the next hurricane hits Florida, right? The Corps is going to step right up there and say, okay, now we can build the beaches from Miami to Jacksonville. This is not a solution to wise coastal management, even given what we know today as a given. We're going to have storms in the future, and sea level is rising. Forget about big projections of sea level rise. Just take the rate of sea level rise today. You know what it tells you about doing this? Here's what just drawing a straight line does. It tells you that every single vulnerability, every single coastal erosion problem we have today, think Highway 12, is only going to get worse in the future. That's what it tells you. Just draw a straight line. There's no, you, don't celebrate. <laughs> just draw a straight line of sea level rise. It tells you every single erosion problem we have today is only going to get worse. It's not going to go down. If you're renourishing beaches, you're only going to have to do it more frequently in the future, not less. It's going to cost more public funds, not less. It's going to be more expensive. It's going to cost more money. And you know what? Nobody has any idea what the compute cumulative environmental impacts are of moving 26 million cubic yards of sand. That's like filling giant stadium with sand 10 to 12 times. It's all coming from the near shore. Then they bury a strip of sand along the beach, right? So you're burying the intertidal zone. The core has always said that the ecosystems recover. And in many cases, that's probably true. But they have only examined these questions one project at a time. Nobody's ever wrapped up the cumulative environmental impacts of doing this on a massive scale, doing it more frequently than we used to, and doing it for the entire East Coast and Gulf Coast of the United States of America. Nobody. <clears throat> it's hard to find a beach in our beach nourishment database that has not had a federal project on it. We're trying to hold the entire shoreline of the U.S. in place forever, primarily with public funds, and the primary beneficiary of this project is investment property along the oceanfront. If you look in the state of North Carolina, you look at the row of oceanfront homes, I'm just talking about the oceanfront here. The vast majority of those people are absentee landowners. The vast majority of that property is second homes, investment properties. Most of it's owned by an LLC or something like that, because when you rent your house, you know, usually form sort of, some sort of entity to do that. So these federal public funds are being used to support these second homes. This is Seabright, New Jersey. It doesn't have a natural grain of sand on it anymore because first they built this big seawall and now the Corps has just pumped up an incredibly expensive new nourishment project. Uh, Seabright, New Jersey is probably the most expensive beach in New Jersey. I think we spent, I don't know, $300 million or something like that trying to keep a beach in front of Seabright. Federal funds. Here's the most recent one, post-Sandy. 
Nice, beautiful beach coming back in front of the seawall. Uh, I'm taking this picture from a hotel. Here's what was hanging on the wall in the hotel, was this lovely photo of the last beach nourishment project, which looks almost exactly like what they're, this was only three years ago. I thought that was sort of interesting. Like looking in a double mirror or something like that. Manaloking, or the huge inlet form during Sandy, Big Beach Nourishment Project has been pumped up here entirely with federal dollars, and they're putting all the houses back right where they were. Right where they were. Second homes, investment homes. The people who own those houses are not paying a dime to have that beach put back. They're building the beaches so high in New Jersey now because they're designing them for storm protection. The, the new beaches are forming these tremendous scarps, like six feet high. Like if my five-year-old went to the sea, he couldn't come back. <laughs> these scarps are so high because the beaches are not ecosystems anymore. They are storm protection. Even the private communities that have been left out are building their own beaches. I'll give it to these folks, at least Bridgehampton and Sagaponic. They're paying for their own project. If you're going to do beach nourishment, I'm not saying you shouldn't do beach nourishment. I'm not saying you shouldn't do any beach nourishment. I'm just saying we can't do it everywhere. And I'm saying that you should pay for it yourself. In Sagaponic and Bridgehampton on Long Island, the oceanfront property owners created a special tax district. They taxed themselves. They paid for the whole project themselves, $7 million. Way to go, <laughs> Sagaponic and Bridgehampton. You know? Uh, and they did it because of this, because th this used to be an in-ground swimming pool, and uh, Hurricane Sandy <laughs> made a lot of the in-ground pools strangely elevated. This is Montauk, village of Montauk. Um, you know, after the storm, you know, beaches are just sort of construction areas now to protect property, really. I mean, it's hard to go to beaches without finding equipment running all over them. The Corps of Engineers is now proposing a massive uh, sort of groin and seawall and nourishment project for Montauk. I mean, the, the old ways are still very well alive. And here's, this is really a great story. So this is the boardwalk from Long Beach in New York after Sandy. You can see just the ribs are left. And this is what it looks like today. This is the, board, the new boardwalk constructed entirely with FEMA funds. 80 something million dollars. It has infrastructure under it, utilities. They put the utilities on the beach under the boardwalk. I understand the love affair that these people have with these boardwalks. I mean, you go to New Jersey, you go to New York, people go, they walk on the boardwalks, they ride bikes up and down, it's nice. You know, you buy some saltwater taffy, um, nice family atmosphere. But the problem is that this is ignoring everything we know about coastal hazards, about the science of sea level rise. It's ignoring reality, is what it is. I'm not saying that we order these people not to do this. I'm simply saying that they should have to pay for it themselves. That local economy should have to cover the cost of that. That's how it should work. You know, Governor Christie told us that we have to spend all this money on the New Jersey beaches because coastal tourism in New Jersey is like a $37 billion a year industry. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, that sounds like a lot of money. Where did it all go? Why can't you tap into one or two percent of that and use it to put your own beaches back? The mayor of Montauk in a architectural sh sh charrette, is that what that, that's charrette, that's right, right, yeah, that I went to, proudly proclaimed that they have the second lowest property taxes in New Jersey on the ocean front of Montauk, while the federal government is spending $50 million to build their beach. We have to figure out a way to incorporate the risk of being in these places into that local economy. In my mind, this is a place where markets really could help us solve some problems. You know? 
These, we need to know what the real value of this local economy is, and the local economy needs to cover the costs. If locals had some skin in the game, if they weren't receiving subsidized insurance, in North Carolina, on the coast, we subsidize flood insurance and we subsidize wind pool insurance, right? If they weren't receiving subsidized insurance, if they weren't receiving federal beaches, numerous other federal subsidies, what would the real value of this economy be? It's not a free market. The coast is not a free market. And if it was a free market, you know what? They would be way more interested in how they spend their money and in the science that we're talking about today. But if you're the mayor of Seabright, New Jersey, and your town's just been wiped out by Sandy, which it was, and the federal government comes flying in in a helicopter and says, hey, how about we put your beach back? And all your roads, your electrical grid, and all that other kind of stuff. Are you going to say, wait a minute, let me get a scientist in here to see where the high hazard areas are, and what the erosion rates are, and what the rate of sea level rise might be in the future? Or are you going to say, oh, yes, please? So the reason we talk about this economics so much now is because we think that that's really the only way we're ever going to get people to think about the science, is if they have to pay for it themselves. The largest seawall I've ever seen constructed to protect a single home was just built in the village of Southampton. Stunning size. This is the message post Sandy. This is a sand dune. It's filled with geotextile tubes underneath. This is um, Quag Village Beach takes on Mother Nature with giant Kevlar sandbags. So this is our Sandy response. It's more of this. Publicly financed, holding the shorelines in place, with no thought to what it means for the future and other places. You know, beach nourishment is great for many communities. I'm not saying we shouldn't do beach nourishment. The Miami Beach Beach Nourishment Project is probably the most important economic tool to rebuild the economy of Miami Beach. It was fabulous. Why is it a federal project? The other problem with beach nourishment is it helps people make bad investment decisions occasionally because it gives this constant illusion that you're living in some place that's stable with a wide beach. And the other problem is that we have absolutely no idea what the cumulative environmental impacts are for beach nourishment projects. This is our next hope, is to really do big picture comparative studies from beaches that have never been nourished with those that have been nourished. I don't know if you've ever spent time on a beach that's received 20 or 30 years of multiple beach nourishment projects, but they're pretty much dead beaches. You don't see foraging shorebirds. You don't see anything there. Beach nourishment comes with other problems that I won't go into today. Um, final message, what we're doing after Sandy is elevating. Elevating is not a long-term solution. On its own. The other thing is the way we do beach fill projects and dune building today, a lot of people like to talk about them as green solutions or soft solutions, but let's not fool ourselves. They are not restoration projects, they're storm protection. And that may be okay, but let's just not pretend. And finally, we have absolutely no national plan for how to rebuild after storms like this. No plan. Everything we do is reactive, it's not proactive. Where was the last place we spent $60 billion doing shore protection? Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Why? That's where Katrina hit. We sp a storm hit someplace, we throw a huge amount of money at it. No forethought. Maybe as a nation we will decide to spend federal funds protecting some shorelines. But should we have a plan for how we do that? <laughs> really, North Carolina is probably being cheated at the moment because so much of that funding was directed to protection projects in New Jersey and New York. Why did Nags have to pay for their own project? Well, I think they should, quite frankly. 
But right now, there's no plan. It's not done equitably. And also following storms, you know, you have like New York, we've really learned how ineffective those agencies are that are supposed to go out there and make sure that all of this is being done well. It's like the Wild West on Long Island right now for what people are doing to protect their homes. We, um, we need a national vision for this. We need a national vision for how we're going to do this in the future, and we need a national vision for, we need a national discussion about how we're going to spend federal funds and how we prioritize where we're going to spend those funds. <laughs> and you can't do it in the middle of a storm. You can't wait for the next storm and then have that discussion. Because when politicians are hugging people and hugging each other like the Obama Christie bromance, nobody's going to make any hard choices, right? These plans have to be made in advance when everybody can be rational. But we've already forgotten, you know? There was outrage at spending $60 billion in some quarters post Sandy, but we've just we've moved on. And the, the plan makes no sense. It's fiscally irresponsible. It's environmentally damaging. And we're, it's a car careening down the road with no driver at the moment. Uh, that's, yeah, I want to do those. Those are my kids. I always put a picture of my kids. <laughs>